Well, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Tuesday edition. You're in the right place for my favorite cases with Dr. Barry Franz. Dr. Barry Franz graduated from honors from Nova Southeast University's College of Optometry and thereafter completed a one-year residency in primary care at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. Barry was a former student of mine there, and he was one of the finest students I ever had the opportunity to, uh, to teach. I'm so pleased and thrilled that he is now uh, at the level that he has, is and what he has accomplished. He is currently a full-time faculty member of Nova Southeast Eastern University College of Optometry, where he holds the rank of associate professor and serves as chief of primary care services at the North Miami Beach Clinic for many years now, and also serves as chair of the Department of Clinics for nearly a decade. He is, a, he is well known in Florida optometry and organized optometry for everything he has done. He is a past president of the Florida Optometric Association, as well as the Broward County Optometric Association. In 2002, he was recipient of the BCOA Optometrist of the Year Award. In 2003, he was NSU's Distinguished Alumni Achievement Award winner. 2006, he was the FOA Optometrist of the Year. And in 2017, he's really achieved the, the highest pinnacle there, the FOA Edward K. Walker Optometrist of the Decade Award. He has published numerous journal articles in the referee literature. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a fellow of the Optometric Glaucoma Society, and a fellow of the Optometric Retina Society, and one of the first optometrists in the profession to become board certified by the American Board of Optometry. He has lectured locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. He has numerous topics, including anterior and segment posterior, uh, posterior segment disease, as well as glaucoma. And I'm proud to say Barry's not just a talented clinical educator, didactic educator, and leader in the profession. He's one of my oldest and closest friends. So with that, please welcome Dr. Barry Franz. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, OEC. And thanks, everybody, for joining us here on a, on a Tuesday night. Um, I don't know how I follow that, uh, um, that very humbling introduction, but, um, but I appreciate it. So tonight, um, you know, we're going to go through six cases. And I have six, what I like to call some of my coolest cases that I pulled out from, um, you know, from, from various things that, um, that we've experienced. Uh, to kind of set up each case, I usually give a, uh, a prequel to the case. So a slide that kind of gets you I, kind of thinking about what we're gonna be talking about. And then we'll summarize it. My goal for each one of you is that um, at the end of each case, at the end of tonight, perhaps um, uh, you know, you'll review some of the things that you've already known and refresh it. Uh, maybe you'll pick up a few clinical pearls and be able to um, apply it to uh, the concepts um, in, uh, in clinic tomorrow. All right, so as Joe said, I'm an educator. Um, I have to sort of come back. Usually when I do these Zoom calls, uh, uh, presentations, they're always with my students. And so um, I typically like to ask a lot of questions. And, and even when I lecture, I like to engage and ask a lot of questions. Unfortunately, um, uh, the format doesn't really allow that, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. And so sit back, like Greg said, uh, I'm gonna take the jet off and take it up to uh, uh, 30,000 feet in a hurry. So real quick, some financial disclosures. I don't have any financial interest in any products or any devices uh, uh, presented here. All the revenue money that I ever make goes, well, to my daughter. And, and, and when she was young, it seemed like it was only pocket change that she used to cost me. And then as she got older, as uh, dollars went to a much, uh, uh, um, a much bigger figure. So they say money isn't everything, but ain't it funny how it sure keeps you connected to your kids. And now my daughter's a uh, sophomore at UF and she's a professional sporting clay shooter. So um, that's where all my money goes. So let's get started and let's talk about the, uh, the first case. As we see when I show this, something to think about, all right? What we're looking at here is we're looking at cornea. This is anterior segment, all right? 
Um, a 45 year old healthy male presents with left eye pain for one day, greater and lateral gaze. Medical history is unremarkable. Ocular history was about of ICSC back in like 1994. And so there was a, a fundus picture, pretty unrelated. Um, slit lamp remark was unremarkable. Cornea conjunctiva, conjunctiva was clear. Anterior chamber is quiet. Dilated fundus exam is unremarkable. Optic nerve head is normal. Visual fields were normal. Color vision is normal. Pressure, 15. Angles open. Kind of chalked it up to, hey, maybe you're having a bad day. This patient must be crazy. I don't see any. The next day, the patient comes back and said, my left eye hurts. I have this intermittent stabbing, deep stabbing pain in the left eye. And it hurts when I move. So when I move my eye, primary gaze it doesn't hurt. But when I turn to the side, look to the side, it's painful. And now I have this foreign body sensation. And so on day one, there was no foreign body sensation. But the day two, essentially, this is what the cornea looked like. Um, patient went to some very, very good eye care providers. And it's determined that these little white epithelial plaques almost could be removed or swiped off with a, with a Q-tip. Incidentally, all the staining um, is a very mild, looks like one very mild, picked up a little bit of Rose Bengal staining. But again, very, very superficial epithelial eruptions here. So what are your thoughts? Patient comes in complaining of pain on eye movement, foreign body sensation, what do we even call these? Epitheliopathy. So that's kind of like my million dollar collect all. It's like as, as, as specific as a conjunctivitis, right? You just call it an epitheliopathy, right? But the patient also has left temporal scalp tenderness. So I'm gonna let you think about that. And I'm gonna digress real quick and talk about an emergency glaucoma referral. This is a 68 year old male and it was just into his cardiologist in the morning. And he was complaining to his cardiologist that incidentally my eyes really red and it hurts. And the cardiologist said, hey, this might be glaucoma. You need to go in and see, see an eye doctor right away. So gentleman comes in conjunctival redness, he said, for two days in his right eye, and his, was painful, especially when his, his, his eye moved, when he'd look to the side. Um, the student's diagnosis was an episcleritis and a scleritis, and here are some of the photographs of the picture, patient's eye. Um, in each gaze, when the patient moved, um, it was painful, and as you can see, the injection here, injection here uh, on the temporal, temporal sclera. So when we looked at him a little bit closer, I looked and I could notice right here on his scalp and, or excuse me, on his forehead, I noticed this sort of ulceration, this little indentation, and it was slightly erythematous. My next question to him, does your scalp hurt? Yes. And so all summed up, what does this turn out to be? Herpes zoster ophthalmicus. And to give you a little background on it, it is a reactivation of the varicella zoster virus, all right, the chickenpox virus. If you had chickenpox in your life, you are at risk for zoster. Right? It is only contagious to those who have not had chickenpox. So zoster is not a contagious condition. However, if a patient never had chicken pox, there is a small but remote possibility that the patient could develop chicken pox from somebody who has an active zoster infection. However, somebody um, is not, you, if, if they're in an active zoster infection and somebody else has had chicken pox, you're not going to develop a, a zoster infection.
Okay, so it is, it's, it's not contagious. We know that the contributing factors are increasing in age, um, anything that can cause um, uh, the patient to be immunocompromised, whether it's disease, medication, spinal surgery, and even stress. Now I have to break HIPAA here and tell you who this patient is. So yes, this was me. Um, when I was about eight years old, Santa Claus brought me chicken pox for Christmas. I'll never forget. Uh, Dr. Caldwell, you'll, you'll like this story. Um, I grew up in Pittsburgh, like where close by where Dr. Caldwell is from. And um, my parents had tickets to go see the Harlem Globetrotters on, uh, uh, at Christmas in downtown Pittsburgh at the Civic Arena. And I couldn't go because I had chicken pox. Well, fast forward to age 45 and at Christmas time, I ended up getting zoster. So a little bit about the ophthalmicus of zoster. 10 to 20% of the population develops some form of it throughout life. And of that percentage, 10 to 25% of all cases of zoster develop ophthalmicus. There's no difference in gender uh, and race. So it doesn't discriminate. The ophthalmicus actually marches out the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. And this is a good schematic to show you the, 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 the nerves that are typically involved in the ophthalmic uh, division. We have the lacrimal, the frontal, and the nasal nerve. Now I can tell you that, that when I was going through this experience, I probably could draw this diagram of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve better than, than Netter did in his uh, uh, anatomy book because I could feel the virus traveling through each nerve. It is an incredible, incredible and terrible experience. Um, it, it felt like almost as if somebody took a string of sp spaghetti or a cord and just pulled it right through um, right through like the foramen of, of uh, uh, like the super orbital foramen. Like you could just feel this sort of um, uh, anesthesia. Um, as the, the virus, as we know, it lies dormant in the dorsal root ganglion and something triggers it and it starts marching out through the pathway. And so every pain, um, every nerve is being involved. Um, I could feel this sharp stabbing pain that went down deep into my, um, uh, deep into my cheek. I could feel up in the corner of the trochlear region, all right, where the nerve exits, uh, the foramen there, it was, it was extraordinarily painful and aching, all right. Um, if the nasal nerve gets involved, um, one can get a, the virus to erupt on the tip of the nose and, and the ciliary nerve of the, the ciliary nerve, which is the portion of the nasal, one of the divisions of the nasal nerve, that becomes inflamed uh, and infected, involved. Uh, that lesion that shows up at the tip of the nose is called Hutchinson's sign. And if that is present, there is a very high probability that the eyeball is going to become involved. Um, so first you get this pain, this rash, and it's typically in that dermatomal distribution. So it typically will never cross the midline and it follows the dermatome, um, just like any other Viral infection, fever, and malaise is often uh, accompanied. It. Here's that typical display of the dermatome being involved in the in, in the patient. So the typical the forehead and the scalp, the, the the temporal area is very very tender. Initially, the pain was sort of like um, tenderness. So I could best describe it as any of you who ever, you know, experience the body aches or when you start getting the flu, you may notice that you, when you touch your skin uh, or your trunk, it just feels very, very sensitive. 
Well, that's how this initially presented. Um, it was just sort of a sensitivity on my forehead and over uh, uh, on the temporal area. So it wasn't painful. It just felt like I, you know, like, like I had the flu, but just in that, in that one area. But then that sensitivity turned to pain and it literally felt like somebody grabbed my hair and just scalped me. It was extraordin extraordinarily painful. Um, other ocular presentations and, you know, one of the big one and why I wanted to, to, to really illustrate this case, because I can do it from a first person perspective, is that there's pain on eye movement, all right? You may have the blepharoconjunctivitis, like the uh, emergency glaucoma referral or an episcleritis. Um, so those are some of the, 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 the clinical signs and symptoms. Uh, when the cornea gets involved, we can have an epitheliopathy, pseudodendrites can be present. Um, we can get a reticular and numbular keratitis, a deep, deep stromal keratitis, which could eventually lead to va near vascularization, keratic precipitates, uh, and neurotrophic keratopathy, which would be the end game. Um, more centrally, you know, uveitis can be present. And as you go back, retinal necrosis, optic neuropathy, all of those cranial nerve palsies have all been reported. Now, interestingly, there's a etiology called herpes zoster sin herpete. That means it's shingles without the rash. Um, this was likely the variety that I had because I never broke out into the rash. I had all the other symptoms, but never had the rash. Now, there's another possibility that one could say that I was very, very fortunate I went on antiviral medication on day two. So day one, I started feeling, you know, something feels kind of uh, uh, funky here. I've got, I'm having this, this, this intermittent pain, this very irregular, nonspecific pain. Um, and then when I developed the epitheliopathy, um, I was able to get on, on Daltrex a thousand milligrams three times a day. So I was able to recognize the signs and the symptoms much sooner than your average patient would be, right? Because they're typically going to show up when the rash shows up. And that may be several days after as this condition is going on. So Perhaps we were able to stop it from um, really fulmigating and developing a rash, or I had the um, um, the herpete sin uh, the uh, um, sin herpete um, um, variety of this of this condition. So um, hard to tell because I went on uh, 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 Valtrex so quickly. Other treatments that are available, oral steroids, they say it may have some benefit. Topical steroids, if the eye is involved, the cornea is involved, is typically a, a must. Um, at the time, Zergan was not available. Knowing what I know today, I would have put it in my eye, I would have tried everything because the sad part about this condition is that even though I had the best of care, corneal train, uh, fellow uh, uh, corneal specialist, um, optometric colleagues like my buddy Joe here, who was one of the first people to, uh, to see me. Um, even though I had the, the best of care, I could not stop it from nailing my cornea. Um, it uh, uh, started infiltrating my cornea very, very quickly. So um, I went on Valtrex um, three times a day for 10 days, started on the second day of pain, Cycloplege with home atropine and initially started Lodamax twice a day. 10 days later, I started to develop some KPs, but still no rash. Uh, increased the PRED, uh, went to Omnipred four times a day and home atropine four times a day. Uh, I had just finished the 10 days of, um, um, treatment of 1,000 milligrams of Valtrex uh, three times a day. So now I went on a, a, a maintenance dose of uh, 500 milligrams uh, daily. 
in two weeks, this stromal keratitis developed. So just when you think that you're kind of out of the woods, that's when I started to develop um, keratitis. Uh, increased the pred to every four hours, from being cycloplege for over two weeks, I developed a mechanical ptosis. I was absolutely miserable. Everything hurt. Even just putting artificial tears in my eye felt like somebody was just taking their finger and just flicking it off of my cornea. One drop was just extraordinarily painful. As you can see, um, the corneal haze, this sort of silver type of uh, appearance. Here's an OCT of the my cornea. Uh, what is unique about this is you can see the inflammation that's, uh, that's present, mostly mid and anterior stromal. At this point, nothing deep stromal was um, uh, uh, involved. So the scalp tenderness turned to pain and neuralgia within two weeks. And that's typically oh. after the vesicles um, um, start to crust over. Uh, the pain can last six to 12 weeks and beyond. As I said, even the artificial tears hurt. And pain that lasts for three months is typically referred to as post-herpetic neuralgia. Now it's less common in people who are below 60. Only 10% of patients typically develop post-herpetic neuralgia, but patients that are over 60 about 40% of them uh, um, will develop the uh, post-herpetic neuralgia. And that, that can be devastating, all right? The pain can be so devastating that people have committed suicide over it. One of the best things that you can do for your patients if you suspect that they have a zoster uh, uh, infection is to get them on an antiviral within 72 hours, all right? You're gonna have to get comfortable with managing their pain or co-manage it with somebody uh, with pain, uh, pain management. I can tell you that um, I tried taking the, the Tylenol and Tylenol with codeine. Um, what actually worked best for me was Motrin. Um, 800 milligrams of Motrin seemed to manage the pain the best. Um, I eventually went on to Neurontin, um, which is gabapentin um, for, uh, uh, for some pain management. Um, and was on that probably for a good three or four months. Fortunately, I never developed any um, um, post-herpetic neuralgia. What I like about this graphic is on the right-hand side, it really shows the course of the corneal nerves. And as you know, your, your epithelium of your, your cornea is super, super sensitive, right? And the reason for that is that you can see that the nerves will come in from the limbus and they will travel right at the base, right by the basement membrane. And then each one will kind of nerve ending will go up through the stratified epithelial epithelium um, and, and, you know, innervate all the way to the, to, to the epithelial cells. Well, what occurs is that as the virus is kind of marching through the your nerves, um, as it's, it's just tearing up the nerve the whole way. And as it kind of finds its way all the way up to the epithelium, it ends up killing um, these epithelial cells. And those white plaques that we saw were really these devitalized um, 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 viral, uh, like viral shedding um, in those epithelial cells. So in the left-hand side here, you can see the OCT. And of course the viral, the, um, the nerve roots will travel straight through the, uh, the stroma up into the basement membrane and then up into the epithelium. And so this inflammation really represents um, the coursing of the virus going through um, the corneal nerves. Uh, how did I manage the stromal keratitis, uh, Omnipred? Um, one of the drawbacks is once you get on that medication, a steroid in the cornea, especially for these, uh, these infectious inflammatory conditions, uh, you're in it for a long haul. And it was really, really hard to, to get off. I actually steroid responded to the Omnipred. So had to go on to some glaucoma meds and, and switch to Lodomax for the long term. Eight month follow up. I was on Lodomax twice a day, kept trying to taper off, but then I would still get some, some inflammation uh, and flare ups. So it was constant, constant 
slow taper, restart, slow taper. Uh, corneal sensitivity was, is lost in my left cornea. So I, I always joke, I can cut an onion and sit there and chop up an onion. And, and what I do is I just close my right eye because my left eye doesn't tear. If I keep both eyes open, my right eye is tearing like heck and my left eye has no, no real corneal sensitivity at all. At 10 months, we try to switch from the low to max to all rex twice a day and then taper. At 20 months, um, we were down to all rex every other day. I tried restasis. There was some anecdotal evidence that said that restasis perhaps could regenerate some corneal sensitivity, um, but, but it, um, it was not effective in my case. All right. uh, and, then, and then fortunately, uh, I did not develop, or should I say I have not developed yet any neurotrophic keratitis. But that's usually the end game in these cases when the cornea is involved. Uh, the tear production is decreased because um, you know you have uh, 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 just the decrease obviously in, in, your, in your blink reflex, you decrease in the cornea sensitivity. When the tear production is re decreased, you get the desiccation of the epithelium. Um, the epithelium typically also has some reduced metabolism because of the damage, uh, and that ends up uh, really um, developing the uh, uh, neurotrophic keratitis. Uh, this is some of my kind of final follow-ups of what that cornea looks like um, with the silver, sort of that silver, silver haze. Fortunately, after um, all these years, uh, my vision has returned to essentially 2025 plus 2020 minus. So I'm very, very fortunate that I haven't lost um, any, but it did drop down to, uh, during the treatment, um, it did drop down to about 2060 or so. Uh, the FDA actually approved a drug. Uh, this made it here to our formulary in Florida. Um, and I'm certain it's uh, available uh, in your state, but Oxervate. And what is really unique about this medication, and it is the very first medication that has been approved for neurotrophic keratitis. So there is some hope for your patients whose cornea has been completely wiped out from, from zoster or, uh, you know, another type of infectious keratitis where they have lost sensitivity. Um, there is a, there is a medication that is available. The dosage and administration is quite intense on this. Uh, it's six times per day, every two hours for eight weeks. So one week of, of this medication, there's seven multiple dose vials. You had seven vial applicators, 42 pipettes, uh, disinfectant wipes for the uh, uh, pipette tips. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty intense and that's just one week supply. But what's even more intense about this medication is the price. So just locally, this price, and, and the irony is, is that, that, you know, if a patient wants to price shop, there's about a $1,500 difference between some pharmacies. So it has a significant, significant price tag uh, out there. And, and it, you know, Barry, it, it's actually very important to point out, you'd better get the coupon because otherwise it might be expensive. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I like the, uh, the the free coupon, which will uh, help bring down this price to something less than uh, uh, suicidal. Uh, how do we prevent it? So Zostavax, as you probably may remember, uh, was approved back in 2006. This was the first vaccine. Um, and it's fortunately, fortunately, I say, is no longer available. Um, back in November of 2020, it's been taken off the, uh, the market here in the United States. And why? It's because something even more significant came on the market, uh, Shingrix. And that was approved in 2017. It is so effective of a medication that it actually just put the Zostavax right out of the market. All right. So the CDC recommends it to um, immunocompetent adults 50 and older. Now I know that there's a lot of discussion about vaccinations and who's for vaccinations and who, are, this is not a political statement. If you have ever had 
chicken pox, chicken pox. I implore you, you do not want zoster. If you can, I would advise to get the Syngrix vaccine. It is extremely, extremely effective and safe. Who should get it? As I mentioned, healthy adults, 50 years and older, should get its two doses um, separated uh, uh, between two and six months. Patients that had a previous history of zoster. So even if you've had zoster, whether it's ophthalmicus, um, you know, uh, on your torso, anywhere, if you've had it before, it's still recommended that you get the Shingrix vaccine because it can absolutely reduce the uh, opportunity for any possible reoccurrence. Uh, even if you received the Zostavax previously, um, you have to wait eight weeks. That's not a problem because it's been off the market since November. So if you've even been previously vaccinated for Zosta, uh, with the Zostavax, you can get the Shingrix. And it's something that you really need to tell your patients, um, especially as they start getting older. Um, patients, if they're not sure that they ever had a chicken pox, go ahead and get the vaccine. Um, there's no maximum age for getting it. Uh, contrary, who should not get it? Anybody, obviously, that has a known re um, allergic reaction to the entity component. Anybody who's tested negatively for the immunity of the varicella zoster virus. If for some reason you've had the test and you show that you never had the varicella zoster virus, then there's a chicken pox vaccine that's available. And so many of the children today, I know my daughter had had gotten the chicken pox vaccine when she's very young, and now she never ever has to worry about ever getting zoster. So the recommendation is that if you've never if if you um, never had the chicken pox and you test negative for for the varicella zoster, then 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 get the chicken pox vaccine. And if you are currently in a zoster outbreak, it's not indicated. And of course, if anybody who's pregnant or breastfeeding. All right, how effective is it in adults 50 to 69? who got the two doses, it was 97% effective in preventing shingles. In adults older than 70, it's 91% of effective. Um, it, when we looked at post herpetic neuralgia, which is typically the painful, lifelong, um, devastating effect of this condition, um, it was 91% effective from adults 50 to 69 in preventing post herpetic neuralgia, and 89% and in adults over 70. So this is a significant, significant finding, all right? Um, the protection remained high, uh, more than 85% after four years following the vaccination. So it definitely has a long sustainability. How can we ultimately get rid of the disease? The varicella vaccine virus, uh, which is what is typically our children get to keep them from getting the chicken pox. So if you had this, great. Um, if you never had this vaccination and you've developed the chicken pox, then Shingrix. Uh, the combination of you know having the varicella, initially nobody will ever, ever develop um, um, zoster, but this is how we ultimately get rid of the disease. I know that was uh, kind of a quick through, but any questions? Yeah, there, there are a few questions, Barry. First off, are you still taking Valtrex preventatively? Um, no, and th that's a good question. One can look to see if that's something that um, um, it, with the, uh, you know, a, a dose of 500 milligrams a day, would that be effective? Um, the fact that I got the Zostavax, um, so no, I do not take um, um, Valtrex preventively. Now, am amniotic membrane treatments have benefits for neurotrophic keratitis? That's the question. I'm sorry. Do, do amniotic membrane do amniotic membrane have benefits for neurotrophic keratitis? It has shown, um, and you know the. Uh, uh, I think one of the indications for Procara is neurotrophic keratitis, and it has been um, um, have shown to be effective in some cases. So. Um, um, but as a, uh, you know, what I mentioned, Oxervate is the first topical medication that's available. We good, Joe? Yeah, there's just one, one comment about uh, 
a patient with shingles, ocular involvement, stromal edema, corneal haze. Uh, steroids were prescribed to reduce inflammation. Went to another doctor for a second opinion. They prescribed Viroptic. He came back, told him not to take Viroptic, but he didn't need it, but he never took it. Didn't take the steroid, didn't take the acyclovir. Uh, basically prescribed artificial tears and pool compresses. Vision got so bad, it could barely see 2,400, didn't follow any recommendations. That's Is anybody crazy. shocked by that? Yeah, no. Yeah. Okay. It's a really crazy thing. I went back to normal, but last time I saw him, last we never took any meds. You know, it's as as you know, we'll talk about um, um, the herpes virus. You know, uh, uh, some of these are are can be eventually self limiting, but they can do some significant significant damage. So, if you can intervene and you can stop. Um, any of the ocular morbidity, um, uh, that's a great service you're doing for your patients. Very good. And Barry, I'll feed off of that by saying that uh, to the audience, the leading cause of cornea vision loss in the United States, not third world countries in the United States is the herpes. Uh, so cornea vision loss is herpes. All right, let's uh, queue up the next case. And there's my teaser slide to let you know that we're not talking about cornea. So, Harry, did you have your uh, your polling questions active? I'm sorry. Do you have your Is that polling to me or questions? Joe? No, for you. Do you have them in your slide deck? I do not know. All right. So, let's do your polling question that you had for the zoster. If we can do that. So which of the following is an incorrect regarding herpes zoster? It is reactivation of the varicella zoster virus, increasing age is risk. It is contagious to someone who has chicken pox. It is painful. And the question is, which is incorrect? Oh, I'm sorry if I said that wrong. No, no, no. I, I'm just emphasizing having taught students for so many years. Oh, there you go. The educator always comes out, does it not? So they're rolling in uh, quite briskly. And I think we're right about uh, 80%. Yep, go ahead. Yep, there it is. Go ahead and pull it and Post it. But which is incorrect, the vast majority have got the answer is contagious to someone who has had chicken pox, which is very sad it is not. Very, good. very good. All right, so this next case uh, actually showed up over Memorial Day. Um, it was a 37 year old female presented with uh, blurry vision. In her left eye, uh, she said after she was being struck to the left side of her globe while playing with her six-year-old son two days prior. So that happened on, on Sunday. Monday was Memorial Day. She couldn't come in. So she showed up um, on, uh, on Tuesday. She denied any redness, no pain, no nausea. Medical history was, was negative. So everything is negative. All right, nothing, nothing um, that, that would stand out. Uh, uh, she occasionally wore some reading glasses. Pupils, motilities, visual fields, they were all unremarkable. Uncorrected VA in the right eye was 2020. In the left eye was count fingers at four feet. So the student came in, you know how it works. Dr. Franz, a patient came in and she said she was hitting her eye. I don't see anything, you know, the, the, the eye is not red, um, but, but she's count fingers at, at, at four feet. And I said, well, did you refract her? He said, no. I said, well, go back and refract her. And so the student goes in, refracts her three hours later, comes back out and said, you know, you're a genius, Dr. Franz. Um, uh, you know, um, when I refracted her, uh, the uh, uh, vision was 20-20 in, in a left eye. I'm like, okay, well, does she have an acute awareness to a chronic problem? What was a refractive error? I mean, refractive error is a minus 50 in a left eye with a little, a little bit of uh, astigmatism. 
So, you know, I had to go into that as a patient and, and, you know, maybe they, they had a, an acute awareness to a chronic problem where you're wearing glasses and your son knocked them off your face or, or anything. No, no, I've only just worn reading glasses. So I had to, had, had to believe the, the, the patient. So we looked, there was no ecchymosis, no subconjunctival hemorrhage, no corneal injury, no anterior chamber reaction. Um, in the right eye, the anterior chamber was deep and quiet. But in the left eye, that's what the anterior chamber looks like. And so to describe what you see, the photographs on the top are the basically Van Herrick angle photographs. And as you can see, there's no shadow um, that the, the uh, optic section is right up against the iris. And a OCT, an anterior seg OCT, you can appreciate that, you know, to kind of give you a reference, this is the cornea down here is sort of where Schlem's canal is. And then you have the iris pinned up against the epithelium in the, uh, uh, in the eye. So the pressure in the right eye was 13. Um, you, know, you don't have to, to answer out loud, but if looking at this slide on the bottom, what would you anticipate or predict the pressure to be? And I'm sure that you all thought it was five, right? Um, kind of the opposite visceral reaction that you would expect to get in, in a patient that no angle structures are seen. So we looked really, really, really good for a Seidel test. There was nothing, no, no Seidel test. Um, there is no evidence of any iridodialysis, iridogenesis, or phacogenesis in the left eye. Um, everything was 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 rock solid. Um, what about gonioscopy? Should we do a gonioscopy? No, oh, sure we could. What do you think that we saw? The angles look like that. So if you put a gonio lens on this patient, what are you going to see? Nothing but cornea and and iris, right? So gonioscopy was not helpful. And then, uh, would you dilate the patient? And this is an area where I usually like to evoke a lot of discussion. Um, you know, should we dilate? Should we not dilate? Um, and one would say, no, we, you know, my students would turn around and their uh, first response is said, no, I wouldn't dilate them because you could put them in angle closure. Well, they're already in angle closure, right? Their angles are closed. They're not in angle closure glaucoma but they're in angle closure. And they're, they're, how we know they're not in angle closure glaucoma because their pressure is five. So we really don't have anything to lose in this case to dilate. And we dilate the patient and this is what we see, all right? Um, if you can appreciate the, the macular region, you can see a number of retinal folds, all right? Wrinkling in the macula. Here is an OCT illustrating, again, the, the retinal fold appearance. So what are your thoughts? You have a patient whose IOP is five. You have angles that are closed, right? You have a very shallow anterior chamber, and you have a posterior pole eliciting retinal folds. Patient refracts to 20-20 but with a minus five. Let's talk a little bit about blunt trauma and some of the consequences. Uh, obviously you can get a traumatic hyphema, an iritis. Remember a soft eye is a sick eye. Um, typically in patients with iritis, when the ciliary body is sick, um, we develop a uh, um, lower pressure, right? Not maybe extraordinary high, um, low pressure or hypotony, but the pressure is typically lower in an eye with an iritis. Um, we can get a medriasis, iridodialysis, phacogenesis, complete lens subluxation, 
uh, cyclodialysis. And then the long-term consequences, you can get um, you can get an angle recession and the long-term consequence of an angle recession may lead to angle session glaucoma. But I really wanna highlight a cyclodialysis cleft. And that's a separation of the ciliary muscle from the scleral spur. So the aqueous drains into the subcoroidal space, which is, will lead to chronic hypotony. Um, this can be observed on, on gonioscopy if the angle is open enough. Um, ultrasound biomicroscope can be utilized in, in an anterior segment OCT. And there's a difference between a cyclodialysis cleft and an angle recession. It's an angle recession is a tear in the ciliary muscle, but the circular and longitudinal layers um, that's the tears between, but ultimately the longitudinal muscle is still attached. So if you're going back, here's your angle anatomy. Here uh, obviously is the iris. And if you're doing gonioscopy, uh, a tear in the, between the circular and longitudinal muscle um, would lead to an angle recession, but the longitudinal fibers are still attached to the scleral spur. So there's a micrograph of, of a angle recession where the muscle is still attached to the scleral spur. So when you do gonioscopy, that's why you see that dark ciliary body band, right? And that's actually the, um, the, the longitudinal muscles that are still attached to the scleral spur in, in a recession. Uh, in, in, in contrast, where a cyclodialysis cleft is involved, that same location um, where the longitudinal muscle is attached at the scleral spur is actually torn away. And so when you do gonioscopy, you actually see sclera um, deep down inside. There is no ciliary body band because the ciliary body is actually torn away from the scleral spur, and that's a cyclodialysis cleft. And what does what develops when that occurs? All right, is we get what's called a ciliary effusion or a ciliary choroidal effusion. And the fluid now, instead of going out the typical pathway, meaning the aqueous going through the trabecular meshwork and draining through Schlem's canal it now actually has a subarachnoid space that it can drain through. And it goes now and collects um, and drains out of the eye. And it can cause the choroid to slightly expand, right? And it can collect in the choroid. Probably the most well-known medication-induced example of this would be a patient that's on Topamax. And we've probably you're familiar with patients on Topamax can develop acute angle closure glaucoma. And, and the mechanism that happens is very similar to the mechanism here. Um, the choroid ends up swelling and that reduces some of the tension on the zonules and causing the whole iris lens diaphragm to shift anteriorly. So as I mentioned before, remember a soft eye is a sick eye. When you get an, the effusion, the anterior rotation of the ciliary body um, reduces the tensions on the zonules. When the zonular tension is reduced, the lens thickens, which induces myopia. Also, the lens iris diaphragm now is pushed anteriorly. That's why your anterior chamber is reduced and shallow. And so that movement of the whole iris lens diaphragm anteriorly, it really changes the effectivity. Remember that optics, that optics um, uh, equation of effectivity, how you change the power, all right? That's what's occurring um, there in the eye. So the shallowing of the anterior chamber um, in a patient that doesn't, obviously doesn't have a cleft, one is, is at risk for an angle closure and ultimately an angle closure glaucoma in cases like patients that are on Topamax. So here's a diagram of a normal eye 
the uh, sort of purple coloring here, that's the ciliary body. As that ciliary body swells, it curls forward and it releases the tension on the zonules. As the zonular tensions release, the lens, basically like a combination, the lens widens, okay? And so it gets thicker. Also, it pushes the lens and the iris anteriorly. And as you can see right here, seals off the angle. And so that is the consequence of the ciliary effusion. And that's the mechanism of, of, of action. So that is why the patient had a five diopter myopic shift. Um, how do we treat it? And I know this goes against all conventional wisdom. You have a patient who is angles are closed, right? And you just have to say, hmm, I got to put this patient, I'm going to dilate them and I'm going to put them on atropine but that's really the treatment. So um, steroids in long-term use have been questionable because if there's cleft present, one feels that perhaps that could slow the healing down. But for us, it didn't matter. We treated the patient with atropine twice a day, uh, put them on PRED and saw them back the next day. They had a four diopter shift. So they were a minus five on, on Tuesday when we saw them, minus five and a quarter. And we saw, them back on, saw her back on Wednesday and she was a minus one a quarter in the eye. Um, so that's a four diopter shift. We were all excited. We were you know, planning for the pressure to, uh, to go up. And just as you would expected, the pressure didn't change at all. And so uh, I'm sure you've all experienced, uh, just like I have many times, when things don't plan as you expect, um, you sort of say this to yourself, what, what, what's going on? Um, ultimately, um, the patient, uh, uh, we stayed the course. And after six weeks of treatment, the patient's final uh, um, refraction came back uh, to, to normal. The cleft heals, which typically takes about six to eight weeks for, for it to heal, and the pressure ultimately uh, returned to 14. So um, final follow-up, everything was completely flat prior. This is the before and the after photograph of the posterior segment, um, the initial presentation of that very shallow anterior chamber. And then again, here is a eight week resolution with the um, um, anterior chamber being fully formed. So I know I went through that quite quickly. I'm trying to make up a, a little bit of ground there, but um, any questions on cyclodialysis cleft? Um, what made that case really unique is that um, I'm able to incorporate a little bit of optics, uh, a little bit of anterior seg and posterior seg um, all in one. Harry, there's a question. Is five diopters a normal shift or is there a larger range? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, it, it, it really depends. Remember, we're only talking about, I, I, my, my speculation is that that's probably a pretty normal range because we're, you know, you're only talking about what is it? One millimeter is three diopters. So, um, you know, the, the, the whole anterior chamber is probably two and a half, uh, to three millimeters, um, um, deep. So, uh, I'm sure that that's the, uh, uh, probably a pretty, pretty normal range. It is the only case that I've ever had of that. I, I've, uh, I've actually known to go eight diopters uh, in Topamax. And Barry, going, if you go, go back one slide, I yep. think this is really important to, to point out and how to differentiate. First off, this is one of those cases you just need to sit down, take a breath and, and look at it kind of objectively. And the important thing here is you're not dealing with Iris Bombay. And this is not a pupil block. This is a flat chamber. That's the difference. You know, Iris Bombay, you've got that bulging pupil. Here you've got a flat chamber. And a flat chamber is, you know, ciliary body effusion and, and, and corridal congestion. And popping a hole in this with an iridotomy is just popping a hole and going to do nothing. 
So that's really, a, I think, a pretty, pretty classic case. Looks like we have a poll here, which is not a complication of blunt trauma at the anterior segment. Hyphema, iritis, iridialysis, or meiosis? And Barry, this is a case of what Alcon was trying to do with their Cypass whenever they had their MIGS procedure. They were uh -huh. taking that too, put it in that super choroidal space. You know. space yep. Yeah, so that's what they were, in a sense, trying to you know, Third treat spacing, glaucoma. Yep. That way. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly right. When you looked at that, when you put up <laughs> that little uh, picture and you showed that uh, seeing the sclera, I'm like, darn, that's exactly what they were going for. It was too bad they got a little cornea endothelial loss and they had a put that procedure on pause, but uh, that's kind of what they were going after, so. All right, polls are rolling in nicely here. What the audience may know, I'm sure that, uh, I know that I have a number of students out there, and Greg, you had a number of students, and Joe, you have another students, but um, all three of us share a very uh, um, um, similar, similar past. Greg and I were, actually uh, um, residents a year uh, a year apart from each other at uh, at PCO so I've uh, uh, I've known Greg and we've actually shared patients um, you know Greg it's uh, probably 25 years now <laughs> yeah it is 19, <laughs> I hate to date that but. yeah 1996 or 1995 yeah, yeah. 96 is whenever yep. we cross paths at PCO so all right, let me share these results. Barry, you'll be able to see the results there yeah, now. I do, I see that. So so good, 84% meiosis. And that is uh, that typically it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the people will go in the other direction usually in, uh, in some of the blood trauma. So, all righty. Next case. I like to call this the contact lens induced glaucoma. Um, so here's my teaser slide have a look. What's really important here that I like to point out, and I really like to call attention to my students, is what it is that you don't see in this case, all right? And what's important that you don't see? And what you don't see is I don't see a red angry eye. And I think that that's what you don't see is equally as important as what you do see. So a 51-year-old black female uh, presented for a contact lens follow-up. And she actually brought some, some papers, uh, you know, and this is going back for, because she brought her, um, her, her old records in with her. And when we were looking through her old records, um, she had a history of corneal edema and, in her left eye with some mild, um, um, uh, fine KPs, some microcystic edema and it was noted that there was approximately four cells, not four plus cells, but four cells and no flare. So that's how, um, um, that's what the chart read. And, and you know, when reviewing her, her records, the pressure was 45 at that visit. And I'll tell you why this is important. Um, with Ganiota, whenever you have pressures that are high, my students come in and say, hey, Dr. Franz, the patient has pressures that are 45. Um, I'd send them right back in the, in, in the room and, and say, Gania, right? We want to know, is that an open 45 or is that a closed 45? So wide open angles. So the, the optic nerves point ones. The diagnosis that, that, that she brought in that was given to her was iritis secondary to contact lens overwear. Um, that's, not, that's not a crazy diagnosis, right? Number of times you've had patients that come in with Claire, the contact lens associated red eye, and they might have had a mild iritis from, from corneal hypoxia from a sleeping in contact lens. So, so it's not completely out of there, all right? But then the next part in the chart, which was sort of alarming, it said the IOP spike, right? And we noticed that, you know, the pressure was 45 in that eye. The IOP spike was contributed uh, um, to the iritis. And so in essence, that's uveata glaucoma. And when I told you in the very beginning, when you look at that patient, uh, what was important in that photograph is what it was that we didn't see, right? I don't really see a red eye. Um, so uveitic glaucoma, um, that suddenly doesn't make sense. We don't get uveitic glaucoma with 
four cells. So that didn't really make sense. The patient was treated, refit, um, you know, plan, come back, refit with, the, with, with another contact lens. All right, so now when I see her, seven years later, this is when she came in and she brought in, in her, her, um, her uh, uh, records because she said, I want a glaucoma evaluation because I've been told in the past that I've had glaucoma and I don't have glaucoma. And that's when she handed me her, her records. Um, and so that brings us up to where we're at today. Measure her pressure today in the exam and her pressure is 48. Yes, those angles are still open. This is on the right eye. This is her photograph of her optic nerve. She still has the same 0.1 CD um, as she had eight years ago. And the pressures eight years ago were 45 and today they're 48. The photograph in the left eye was trying to um, illustrate some of those fine KPs, but, but here is the non-dilated. This is what that um, anterior segment looked like. All right. So as you can appreciate the attention here um, towards the center and just below the pupillary axis, you see these white accumulation of white blood cells. All right. Uh, we like to call those fine keratic precipitates. We see that very, very often in patients who have uveitis. Um, you know, if they're mutton fat, they'd typically be a granulomatous. These are fine KPs, very well um, demarcated. And so this is typically what you would see in a non-granulomatous uveitis. But, but what is one of the common accompanying symptoms in a uveitis? And that's usually sort of an eye that, that is, has some pain, photophobia, and lacrimation, and they can get that circumlimbal flush. Um, again, what's equally important in this case is what we don't see, and I don't see any of that. And the patient didn't have any of the any of the symptoms. Here's an OCT of of a cornea that has some um, keratic precipitates, maybe some uh, the different patient, but but it can also cause a little bit of focal microcystic edema there in the cornea. Um, I'm going to digress and throw in another case because it's the same type of condition, very similar. But here's a 24-year-old female. Um, she comes in with blurry vision and she happens um, to say that it, it, it has occurred twice a year ever since she was seven. Her visual acuity was 2015 and 2020 in the involved eye. Um, everything was normal except she had a steamier cornea, KPs pressure was 70 and the anterior chamber is deep. What are your thoughts? Uh, we have a, a, a white and quiet eye for the most part, elevated unilateral intraocular pressure, mild, mild anterior chamber reaction, a couple of cells um, and, and extremely elevated IOP. And this is a case of posner schlossman syndrome or glaucomatocyclitic crisis. Uh, you know, it typically occurs between the ages of 20 and 60. It's rare over 60. Uh, it's unilateral and it is recurrent. Um, it can be mildly symptomatic and it can be asymptomatic. Um, and the, 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 any symptoms would be because of the blurry vision. You know, we do know that if pressure goes up typically above 42, the endothelial pumps shut down and they can't, the sodium potassium pumps and the endothelium shut down and they can't get the water out of the cornea. And that's why patients will typically develop edema in their cornea when their pressure goes, uh, pressure goes high. You know, the real take home here that I want to really um, um, drive home is that you will see intraocular pressure, which is very, very disproportionate to any amount of anterior chamber reaction. You will scour the anterior chamber and only see a couple of cells. And that's the real take home message, all right? This is an inflammatory uh, condition um, and, and it, it's 
my thoughts, it's likely because of herpes. Um, you know, the herpes virus has been implicated. There's been a study uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, the, the herpes virus has been found in these cases, but the herpes virus has a very, very unique way of causing a trabeculitis. And when a patient has a trabeculitis that increases the interocular pressure, typically it does, the herpes virus can do two things increase interocular pressure and cause iris atrophy. And so I believe, and I've been saying this for years, I believe that the herpes virus uh, is the etiology of many more conditions, both ocular and systemic than we currently have identified. And in this case, um, in glaucoma cyclitic crisis, you think about the natural history of the, the disease, the condition, it comes, it does its thing. If you do absolutely nothing at all, it will likely just burn itself out and resolve. Think about other conditions that have a very similar um, um, uh, disease process, like a Bell's palsy, right? It comes, it does its thing, and maybe four to six weeks or shorter, um, it may completely resolve, all right? Just like the, uh, so, so in, and one of the current treatments for Bell's palsy is to put patient on, on Valtrex. So um, look at Fuchs, heterochromic syndrome, right? Um, you know, you've got iris atrophy, could be viral in, in etiology, could be associated with glaucoma. So there's a number of things um, that, that, that I think could be um, directly related to herpetic. Uh, this is a self-limiting, um, but, but we do typically want to go after the inflammation. This is one of those cases where uh, you want to hit the patient with a steroid. Medications that we want to avoid, we want to avoid myotics, and to the most extent, we want to avoid any type of prostaglandin when we're attempting to lower the pressure, because we do know that prostaglandins can, um, can, can lead to, uh, uh, to uveitis and, and inflammation. All right, beta blockers, adrenergic agonists, CIAs are all uh, um, um, uh, fine. In the case of the, the young lady, we treated her with steroid, we dropped her pressure, and after uh, about 30 minutes, her pressure came down to 40, the edema went down, she's like, I feel fine, can I go home? Um, the other case, just, just um, I like Predforte, um, put the patient on Predforte, um, if you have to manage the optic nerve, then, then again, uh, or should I say protect the optic nerve, manage the glaucoma, and reduce the pressure using an aqueous suppressant, an alpha-2 agonist, um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, all right? Um, very rarely we really have to go to any heroic means like an oral osmotic to bring down the, uh, the pressure. You want to avoid the myotic and prostaglandins. Uh, and remember when encountering unexplained unilateral IOP rise, um, look careful for cells and KPs and especially at follow-up and think herpes. Address the inflammation first and then the pressure second. This is an inflammatory condition and, and, and we um, go after it with a steroid. And Greg, you can launch a question, uh, the, the polling question. And if anybody has any questions, I'll take them. The poll is launched uh, there, Barry, regarding uh, yep. glaucoma cyclitic crisis. Barry, Which one of the pearls. Not, not a typical clinical presentation. So it's what's not typical in this. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to just say one of the pearls that I like to give to the audience, you know, I have a handful uh -huh. of patients and these patients come in with these high pressures and yeah, I agree 100%. It's the steroid that treats us, but then it always makes us nervous with that pressure being that high. So, you know, I'll use Combigan, you know, four times a day uh, in the, like the left eye or, uh, uh -huh. you know, generic uh, Cosopt, you know, four times a day. And people will look at me and they'll be like, oh my gosh, he's using, you know, a beta blocker four times a day, you know, and, you know, it came to me one day that if I use four drops between two eyes, isn't it just the amount, the same outgo in the body, if I just use four drops in one eye. So it's been really nice in the office when these come in, just to be able to just say to the patient, usually there's a sample, or if there's no samples and, you know, you can go with generic COSOP, it doesn't usually cost that much. And you don't have to really pound them with a whole bunch of bottles, just say, here, use your steroid and use this, uh, 
you know, Khan began uh, four times a day in that left eye. It's the same amount of drops if you're putting it between the two. So you're not putting the patient any risk. So a nice little pearl out there. All right, there, there, yep. there were a couple of questions that came in. Were either of the patients immunocompromised? No, but that's a good, good question. No, they were not immunocompromised. And what about cytomegalovirus? So surely can be an, a, a possibility. Um, I'm not saying that all of these are, are um, herpetic. Uh, CMV has been um, implicated uh, in the past. I guess it, can, it surely can be a possibility, but whether, you know, the unique things of herpes is the interocular pressure increase. So um, can CMV cause um, a, a interocular pressure increase? And, um, you know, I just, uh, I'm, I haven't seen that. Yeah, and well, I'm gonna, you know, in a sense, chime in there, Barry, is that, you know, the herpes viruses, they're neuronal viruses. That's where they hang out, where some of the other viruses are maybe hanging out in some of the white blood cells and they're more of a cellular origin rather than a neuronal. So I agree that, you know, the, all those conditions that you talked about, you know, you talked about uh, Bell's palsy, kind of neuronal, right? The, yep. the, 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 the Fuchs heterochromic kind of has a neuronal pattern. So does this. So, you know, you know, I believe a lot of these, like you said, have a lot of probably viral etiologies. And if you could figure out them all out, I would bet you that herpes would be leading the, the cause on that. So, you know, they, they have actually found cytomegalovirus virus in the anterior chamber of patients with a glaucoma cyclitic crisis. And they found other patients where it was not present, but yeah. it's, it's still developing, but now there, now there has developed a trend where the term CMV glaucoma or CMV uveitis is, become, is being used more. And they're beginning to start to refer glaucoma cyclitic crisis as CMV uveitis or CMV glaucoma. So I think we're gonna see a lot more of that uh, in the near future. I just, I just wish the disease would have an easy to say name. Yeah. You know, Posner Schlossman, <laughs> glaucoma cyclitic crisis or cytomegalovirus, you know, glauco you know, there's just no easy, um, no easy, uh, name no, no easy name pronunciation. All right. So let's, uh, Barry, there's your results. I'm not sure if you can see them. I, I, I did. I up. saw them. I saw yeah. them. So yeah. very, very good. Very good. Here's an anterior photograph um, of the lower bulbar conjunctival, uh, palpebral conjunctival of the patient. So let's talk about it. This is a 16-year-old male presents with red itchy eyes, left eye greater than the right eye for three weeks, doesn't wear contact lenses, saw a pediatrician a week ago and was given chromalum sodium twice a day. All right. Uh, this is how the eye looks. I don't know if you could appreciate this sort of puffy, boggy conjunctiva here, but, but, but it is um, definitely uh, chemotic. When we averted the superior lid, um, we can see this sort of fine papillary reaction on the superior lid. Kind of overall conjunctivitis, uh, watery, watery sort of discharge. And the cornea, has these peripheral corneal infiltrates. Okay, so subepithelial infiltrates on the on the cornea. So, um, you know, we put there. What, what are your thoughts? And I'm sure that you're all thinking of of, of you know what's in the in the differential. Um, but we're going to add them up for you. So we have a patient that has peripheral corneal infiltrates. He has a superior papillary reaction and he has an inferior follicular reaction and he has a lot of itching. Itching and a ropey mucousy discharge. And you can see a little bit of mucus here. Um, we cleared some out, but typically the mucus is sort of roped around in these, um, in the follicles. If you really want to get an understanding, and I'm sure you've, you know, all of you are very, very seasoned um, practitioners. But what I tell my students now is that if you really want to understand and get a good idea what follicles look like, 
look in your children, all right? Any of your pediatric patients, they have, and it's a normal presentation in pediatric patients, is they're gonna have a ton of follicles, okay? Uh, and that, that, that's just normal, but that's how I get my students to get a very good feeling of what it is that they're looking at inferior. Um, the patient all pre also presented with the palpable preauricular node. And then my question is, do we get a preauricular node in an allergic conjunctivitis? Um, and that's, uh, that, answer, that answer is no. So bilateral preauricular node, and he has a history of at-risk sexual activity. And so, you know, when you have to breach these subjects that, that can be uncomfortable, um, I try to teach the students that way I present these cases. Now, this was a 16-year-old, and I had to separate the 16-year-old from mom um, to ask him the, the, the appropriate questions. But whether it's a, 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 an adolescent or an adult, it can be an uncomfortable situation if you, if you start to inquire. So how I breach it is that I don't come out and say, you know, um, are you sexually active or, or, you know, whatnot. I'll just say, um, you know, what we see in your eye could be one of the sexually transmitted diseases. And are you at risk for an STD? And then I go ahead and I define risk. And I say, um, and, and at risk means if you had unprotected sex in the last 30 days. Uh, typically within, 50, like within the last two weeks, I would be the most suspicious, but, but um, you know, patients are going to, to you know, try to say, well, I wasn't, it wasn't 14 days, but maybe it was 15 days, so I'm gonna answer no. So I just wanna get in a general idea, are they at risk? If they say no, then I'm going to go down to something else on my differential. But but if they are at risk, then you have to um, um, consider chlamydial inclusion conjunctivitis. It is the number one STD in the U.S. after after HPV. So HPV is the number one STD. Um, it's actually the second. Uh, teenagers and young adults are um, you know in the uh, um, the highest risk. It is systemically asymptomatic in most women and many men. It presents as a vaginitis in females and a urethritis in males. So that's why males may be a little bit more symptomatic, uh, but only 50% of them are symptomatic. Um, it is a reportable disease to public health authorities. So if you happen to do a conjunctival swab and you have the, um, like the cyto brush to do uh, in your office and send it out and it comes back positive, uh, you, you're obligated to report it to the health department. Um, we know that there are three, three forms. We have the adult inclusion, neonatal, and trachoma. Um, what makes this such a difficult etiology to initially diagnose is because it has microscopic features of both viral and bacterial. So that's why you get the mixed papillary and follicular response in your patient. And I'll be honest with you, um, this can look just like EKC in the early stages, all right? Itchy, um, and after a week, you know that, that you can typically get subepithelial infiltrates in EKC. So it is, um, um, it is most common for practitioners to initially treat this as a viral conjunctivitis or an allergic conjunctivitis, especially in its early stage. And it's only when it doesn't respond to treatment is then when most practitioners then go down to the, the, the next uh, um, um, differential and start inquiring about um, um, STDs. What is also unique, even though that this is a systemic infection, it typically presents unilateral. This was a, um, um, this patient had a bilateral presentation, but was much more in one eye than, than the other, all right? These uh, infections, these ocular infections are self-inoculated, meaning that the patient has a uh, genital uro and your uh, genital uro infection but they by by not washing their hands after they go to the bathroom uh, touching themselves and then touching their eye that's how it's transmitted to, typically to the eye all right um, it will respond a bit to antibiotics 
So, you know, your first response uh, thought would be, hey, let me put this patient on Tobradex and, and you'll see them back in a week. They're going to feel better. They're going to look a little bit better, but they're not going to be resolved. And that's typically what happens when, when we go to the next treatment line and say, hmm, I think maybe I have to be changing my difference or looking at a STD here because they're not getting better after a week or 10 days on an antibiotic or antibiotic steroid. All right, ropey mucopurulent discharge, itching. Hallmark, one of the hallmark signs is itching in these patients, all right? Um, quickly, the, the treatment. Um, the treatment of choice now is oral azithromycin, and it is one gram once a day. So you can either send the patient down to the pharmacy with a prescription for four 250 milligrams of azithromycin and tell them to gobble them all down with a glass of water, that will take care of the systemic and the ocular infection. Um, well, topical azocyte, would that help to um, um, resolve any of the anterior that, um, you know, the, the jury's out on that. It, it is topical azithromycin. Um, some, some, ad, some practitioners advocate using it. Um, in the cases that I have seen, I've not, I've not used it. Um, in this particular case, it was the, the mom was really upset with the son um, because he developed this. And so she chose not to go on the one day to get rid of it. She made her son suffer um, with uh, two weeks of doxycycline, 100 milligrams BID. And that really was the treatment of choice before azithromycin came out. All right. Um, with patient and their sexual contacts should be evaluated and treated for other STDs. So you do tell, have to tell your patient, please alert any of your partners um, that, you, that you have a, a, an STD. This was the top was the before and the bottom um, after treatment with azithromycin. So the follicles, as you can see, um, did, uh, did resorb nicely. And uh, there's the superior bulbar con or palpebral conge with the papillae and they all flattened down and, and resolved nicely. So got through that one in a, in a hurry. Any questions? And Greg, you wanna go ahead and throw the, the poll question up. Which of the following is not correct? regarding chlamydial infections. Well, Barry, I, I, I yeah. mean, we, we didn't get any questions. We didn't get any questions. We had a, people, a lot of people engaged. They knew what the answers were. They knew what the, uh, the treatment was. Uh, I thought that it was very nicely uh, engaged in that, uh, in that discussion, very well handled. And that uh, sure. is a nice example that really proves the adage that uh, exotic, exotic lifestyles can lead to exotic uh, conjunctivitis. <laughs> All right. Good. Yeah. Rolling in very nicely. But yes, I've had... Um... I've been in the in, in this. I've had several several um, situations where where we've had to have this discussion, and you know, like I mentioned, it can get uncomfortable um, with patients. So, um, and so the majority got this correct. It um, the incorrect answer is that it is the number one STD in the U.S. Uh, HPV is the number one, so um, that is the incorrect answer. And you're right, Barry, it can, it can be a difficult, but I think the way you phrased it was ideal in getting the most accurate information. And people can kind of learn to word it that way, that, that would be great. You know, just asking, right. are you sexually active is not, yeah. uh, not effective. I, I did that with a patient once. His response was, you know, not really. Uh, what does that mean? Not really. I, I just let it go. Great. Okay. Next case, and no, we're not gonna talk about veterinary medicine, but we are gonna talk about itching. So a 34 year old male comes in with very itchy red eyes, itchy, itchy, itchy eyes. Um, and he reports recently taking the red eye flight from Las Vegas. Right there. Um, 
the student comes in, you know, we love working with our students and the student is flipping out. I am not going back in there. I think there were worms or something in his eyelashes. What do I do? I'm going to be sick. And there is what we have. Um, I can outline this critter for you. Um, we don't, we don't need um, any um, scanning laser ophthalmoscope uh, to make this diagnosis. This is purely a clinical diagnosis. Um, as you can see, we have an organism right here. These legs are tied on to this um, eyelash, and this is the front of the body, which buries in, um, and this is the back of the body. This is your typical crab lice, louse or pubic louse, all right? Um, what we see here on the eyelashes, these are called nits. Um, this one is cracked. This, is, this one is already hatched. Maybe it was this guy, I don't know but this is a knit that has not hatched yet. You have heard the term nitpicking. Well, that's where the term comes from, okay? Is in order to help heal this condition uh, and treat this condition, these little knits have to be picked off the um, eyelashes or the eyelashes have to be removed. Uh, here's another critter buried deep into the eyelashes, eyelids. So, you know, the patient came, was in Vegas, just came back from Vegas. Um, apparently what happens uh, in Vegas stays in Vegas is not necessarily true in this case. Um, you know, let's, uh, let's talk. I know you've, you've heard that, 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 you know, these things can jump. You know, lice can jump. They cannot jump. They're crabs. They don't fly and they typically don't transmit any disease. There are three types of crab lice or uh, lice. Um, there's the head louse, the body louse, and the pubic louse. Th those three all have morphologically different bodies. And it is believed if you see a louse in the eyelashes, it is a pubic louse. And the reason for that is because the distance and the coarseness of the eyelashes um, mimics most the pubic region and the pubic hair. So the head and the body louse typically don't thrive in the eyelashes and the pubic region. Um, what, what occurs is some of the ocular manifestations, as you can imagine, um, whenever that organism um, um, has any excrement, it can get into the conjunctival sac and cause a huge, huge um, um, uh, conjunctival reaction, all right? So you can get a bad um, blepharoconjunctivitis, follicular conjunctivitis, a lot of itching, all right? Uh, and and this is how the, you know, these things live. They go in there and they start digging down and you can see the blood tinge here, um, start uh, um, sucking blood. I can make you one guarantee. I don't care if it's going to be the first case that you see, or if it is the 10th case that you see, I can, I will guarantee you all this one thing that at some point in the exam, you will reach up and you will scratch some part of your body because you're going to feel really, really, really skeezed over the, over the whole situation. <laughs> all right. So, um, uh, that's, uh, um, uh, that's it. You know, how, what do you do when you remove them with the forceps, you've got to go in there and, and debulk it. Um, patients want them removed. So, so forceps are probably the best. Um, you know, the question always comes down to where do you put them? When you take them off, you just fling them on the floor. You know, where, where, where do you put the little critter? So um, some recommendations, you can use a contact lens well with some alcohol in it. Uh, you could go to the optical, get a paper, uh, a cup with some acetone, put them in there. That will, uh, that will kill the organism. So, but you don't want to fling them through the, um, through your exam room. Uh, here's another case though, that's gonna, um, I really wanted to, to um, provoke some thought. A seven year old boy presents with itchy red eyes. And that's what his eyelashes looked like. This was the largest infestation of lice that I have ever seen. As you can see, all the, these are all nits and this fuzziness here, these are just dozens and dozens of bodies in there. Um, 
And so what are your thoughts when you have a seven-year-old boy? What do you do? Now, I will spare you all. What did we do? Um, I actually called a pediatric ophthalmologist and said, because I had no idea. I didn't know. I know, obviously, I knew how to treat the, the, the lice, but I didn't know what to do in the situation with the boy. So the pediatric ophthalmologist said, it's interesting that you called because this was just a topic of a nationwide blog and a worldwide blog. And the general consensus was, we call the patient's pediatrician um, and, and involve them because with a child, you get the, the you know, you, you have the concern that perhaps there is sexual misconduct going. So I called the patient's pediatrician. Um, I spoke to mom first and explained what happened. And mom said, how can he have pubic lice in his eyelashes when he's seven years old? He doesn't even have pubic hair. So, so the pediatrician, um, we explained it to him. He said, thank you very much for calling me. Send mom, dad, and the boy over to my office right away. I will do a complete physical examination and determine if there's any other um, evidence of perhaps sexual uh, misconduct or abuse. The pediatrician called me back and said that, that there was nothing um, he could, you know, um, in the, in their thing, there was nothing in the previous exam. And it was later disclosed that the boy had went to Haiti and lived with his aunt um, over the summer and spent um, three months in Haiti and she was sleeping in the same bed with his aunt. And so it was the poor hygienic conditions that the boy lived in is what attributed um, to, uh, to the lice. So how do you treat it? You want to first physically remove the little critters as much as you can. Um, you know, the literature said smother with a bland ointment. Bland ointment is nothing but petroleum jelly. These are arthropods. They respire through their skin. So any ointment will suffocate them. I like to use bacitracin, an ophthalmic ointment. Um, I will have them coated um, three times a day to four times a day. I'll have the patient use it. Um, and then you can put, uh, you know, a, a Maxitrol or, or Tobradex in the eye uh, to help with the blepharoconjunctivitis. This, although it is uh, mostly STD, it's not reportable to the public health authorities. Um, there are some other alternatives, type, you know, um, removing the eyelashes, cryotherapy, laser photocoagulation. That kind of seems fun to be able to fire your $100,000 laser beam at these little critters to try to kill them. But, um, you know, just uh, putting uh, uh, the ointment on three to four times a day and um, having them uh, uh, use a pediculite shampoo. So you um, mix is uh, um, over the counter. Uh, it's found in Walgreens and Target and and every, every basically pharmacy, grocery store, Walmart. Um, the patient will simply, because um, you know, ask them to, they'll need to shampoo, put a shampoo, have them shampoo all the hairy and axial regions of their body. Uh, I think you wait for like five minutes, turn the water off, wait for five minutes, and then rinse it off. Um, in that time, it will kill any live organisms. It doesn't kill the nits, um, but it will kill a lot of the live organisms in a wash of the body. And they'll do that um, daily for a week. You have to wash linens in really, really hot water, bed, uh, the bedding. Um, and, and obviously you've got to educate the, uh, the patient and they'll need to really notify any of their partners uh, as well as um, if it is a child, you want to um, um, involve the, uh, a pediatrician. So that's, uh, that's how you treat um, um, crab lice. And last is which is the following treatments are best for eradicating crab lice infestations of the eyelashes. Uh, Barry, as you talk yeah. about the over-the-counter pediculicidal med medications, and uh -huh. we, we know we can't use them on the eye because they're toxic. Interesting, there, there's no warning on their label. This and says do not put in the eye. Yeah, there's no, there's no, yeah. uh, no warning because and, and, and Joe, you bring, you bring up a good point, and in my haste, I I neglected to say that 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 you do not have them shampoo their eyebrows or their eyelashes uh, with with mix. Um, uh, only the the bland ointment. Uh, or should I say, or I like bacitracin because the the skin gets excoriated and it helps um, um, any other um, um, prevent any other lid infections. But it's just interesting that the, the average lay person wouldn't know that because I said it's not it's not on the label. And the yeah, way I found it out was I was I happened to be walking down you know in the grocery store in Publix and 
I have to walk down the aisle and it's really quite high up. And I saw these two products right next to each other. So I took them down. I was looking at them very intently, uh, reading them to see if they're, you know, if they had these, these warnings and, and they didn't. And, and after a few minutes, I looked up and saw a number of uh, suburban housewives kind of looking at me kind of funny. So I was kind of glad I had a mask on at that point. Hey, but you're funny, Joe, because you, you are correct. They're, they're all on the top shelf. Mm -hmm. Yep. They're on the, they're on the top shelf. All right. Very, very, very good. 85% are with us. All right. And so as I start to decline and come down out of altitude, we're going to finish the, uh, the last, the last case. And again, we're not talking about cornea, a little bit of posterior sag. A 52 year old Hispanic male uh, complains of a blind spot in his left eye for three weeks. Um, the only thing he had in his medical history that's some GERD, you know, hernia repair, but everything else was non contributory. No recent illnesses, um, no recent travel reported. Um, past ocular history was non contributory. Vision was 20 20, but in his left eye, um, he noticed that, that, that the letters on the right side, right of the line, were visible, but on the left part of the line, looking straight ahead, he couldn't see them very well. He had an APD in a left eye. Uh, on confrontations, he seemed to have some temporal constriction. And on Humphrey, he had an enlarged blind spot. Uh, Amsler showed a temporal scotoma in the left eye. So there's a visual field of his left eye. Right eye is perfectly normal for the most part, but he's got an enlarged blind spot here in his left eye. Blood pressure was normal, color vision was normal in each eye. There was no anterior chamber reaction, pressures were normal. Posterior segment was only remarkable in the left eye. And as I showed you in that slide, we had some, an elevated optic nerve, intraretinal hemorrhages. And if you can appreciate in this slide, we have these striations here. Okay, so we have a swollen nerve, some intraretinal hemorrhages. I guess you can all appreciate this is a swollen nerve. Um, it's not quite the, the uh, champagne cork type of swollen nerve, but it's definitely um, swollen. We've got loss of, of um, the rim integrity. You have vessels that become buried and, and, and reappear. So swollen nerve interretinal hemorrhages, and we have these striations going out into the macula um, from, from the optic nerve. There is a more um, blown up um, uh, view of the, of the optic nerve, all right? So what do we have? We have a neuro, because the optic nerve is involved, but you also have a retinitis because the retina is involved. So optic nerve with interretinal hemorrhages, um, there's the retinal striations. These retinal striations, this represents fluid that gets leaked from a retinal vessel. There is no macular star. Um, sometimes we can get some, some macular star formation in these cases. This is just an OCT demonstrating the uh, edematous optic nerve. So what are your thoughts? When questioned, a patient reports being exposed to a new litter of kittens in the house. And some of my audience is going to get this reference. Many of my audience doesn't get the reference. My students, unfortunately, at this point of life, um, don't get this reference anymore. Um, but but Ted Nugent um, um, came out with the very famous song, Cat Scratch Fever. So that is the diagnosis. This is essentially a neuroretinitis secondary to the Bartonella Hensley organism. All right, cat scratch disease. Here is the clinical pearl. It is a systemic infection by gram negative Bartonella bacillus. The medical history, including recent travel or animal exposure or skin lesions um, is really necessary to help facilitate the diagnosis. Neuroretinitis, it's an inflammation of the optic nerve 
leading to optic nerve swelling and the surrounding retinas resulting in a serous detachment uh, that typically involves lipid deposition resulting in a macular star, all right? Cat scratch disease is the most common associated etiology of infectious neuroretinitis. Um, it's caused by the Bartonella Henselae. There are two Bartonella, um, but the Bartonella Henselae is the organism most implicated in this. All right? Cat scratch disease is found worldwide, associated with domestic and feral cats. It's been reported that 40% of cats may be infected with Bartonella, uh, typically the age of 18 and younger, uh, and a higher incidence in males. And why is that? Probably because females, are pro there's probably more cat owners, boy, male boyfriends, 18 coming over, playing rough with the cat, cat doesn't like him, scratches the male, all right? Hospital admissions are more common in adults, especially with weaker immune system. Um, and there's a seasonality, uh, the fall and the winter in the United States where we see this more, and most likely because more people are spending time indoors. It is typically a self-limiting benign infection. Um, the patient will have your typical flu-like symptoms, okay, because it is an infection. So they have a malaise, the fever, um, a fatigue, um, and obviously if the patient is immunocompromised, they're a greater risk for systemic and ocular involvement, okay? So we can uh, ask the patient, do they have any scratches uh, uh, or have they been in contact uh, um, with the cat? Other anterior segment manifestations, paranods, ocular glandular system, um, uveitis might be present. And then the posterior segment is the neuroretinitis, right? That's the sudden painless loss of vision. It's typically unilateral. It may be bilateral, but typically unilateral. And that's where we have the optic nerve swelling with hemorrhaging. Um, a patient will develop a macular, macular star and exudate a scar. Um, usually within the first three weeks. This lipid is actually comes from the fluid that leaks from the blood vessels in the optic nerve and it follows the raphe in the, in the macula, right, in the retina um, and, and um, displays out into uh, the, retin, the, the, the retinal tissue along the, uh, the, the raphe, all right? So there is a, a picture again of the, the star formation in, in neuroretinitis, but not all of um, the retinitis. And I probably have seen three to four Bartonella cases and uh, only one, uh, I believe, had, had any lipid. So majority of the ones that I've seen never had any uh, lipid uh, deposition. Here's a case with the nerve is swollen and we have the um, um, retinitis. Again, another case, swollen optic nerve, and you can see the, the, the macular retinitis uh, present, all right? Case history, exposure to cats, skin lesions, any recent travel um, is really important to make the diagnosis. When you wanna order lab tests, there are other things that can cause, obviously, neuroretinitis, um, toxoplasmosis, Lyme disease. So we usually include those um, in our workup. But, but you know, you really want to focus on the Bartonella Hensley antibody, all right? Um, it's a titer test. Uh, it's IgG. Anything above 128 is positive. In our case, um, the patient had, was one in 256 dilutions. So it was uh, a positive IgG. The IgM was negative and all the toxo, uh, um, plasmas, plasmosis um, um, panel was also negative. ACE was slightly, slightly elevated. Um, because it's self-limiting, Antibiotic treatment oftentimes is optional in immunocompetent patients. It is um, recommended that, that uh, if a patient is immunocompromised that you put them on uh, uh, antibiotic. There are several antibiotics that, that are um, effective against this. There's not really a general consensus on which one. Uh, azithromycin will hit it, right? BAMP and ciprofloxacin will hit it. So a number of them are, are, are effective against it. In our patient, um, he went on doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day, um, came back in a month. We did a visual field. Um, his vision kind of came back. Um, he still had a large blind spot 
kept him on the uh, medication for another month. He was on doxycycline for a total of eight weeks. He still had a uh, uh, enlarged blind spot. And then um, finally, uh, um, he did have a complete resolution vision. This was um, prior and the one year resolution. So a complete uh, resolution of the, uh, um, the swollen nerve and the, and the retinitis. So the, the final clinical pearls on this is cat scratch disease is the most common infectious etiology associated with neuroretinitis. So you have a patient that comes in with unilateral optic nerve swelling and a retinal, um, a retinitis, right? Um, with or without a macular star, you diagnose them with neuroretinitis, cat scratch disease is the most common infectious etiology to that, right? The thorough history, including past animal exposure, um, ask about any skin lesions or, or travel. Uh, remember, it is self-limiting and the prognosis for complete resolution, even though it looks really bad, uh, the prognosis is very good. We want to order IgG and IgM titers of the Bartonella hensley organism. Uh, and when antibiotic therapy is, is, is employed, um, doxycycline seems to be effective, but the patient's going to be on it for six to eight week therapy. And that brings us to the conclusion. Hey, Barry, uh, I got a question. And Joe, this yeah. is for you and Joe, I guess, Barry and Joe. Um, you know, from a guy that I'm going to be heading out to Vegas tomorrow and was just in Hawaii and, uh, Mackinac Island and Muncie, Indiana, and you keep referencing, uh, you know, frequent travel with this condition, you know, I thought this was associated with kitty cats is, you know, what is the freak, help me out with the frequent travel. I, I don't really know. So what am I looking for? Are they go into out of the country, you know, what's the frequent travel pattern that I'm looking for in this condition? Well, the, the, the essence of frequent travel is that they can be exposed to. So um, the veterinary medicine in the United States is, you know, one could argue is in, 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 as, as good, if not the best. Um, but if you're going to a country that it does not have the industrialization that, that we have and access to um, good veterinary medicine, then many of the pets can have um, um, Bartonella. Okay. So, so is it frequent that, travel that is, then with then in a sense being around animals or cats? Animals. Is that, is, right. Is that, right. Is that, right. Okay. Right. 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 Now, a lot now of there has been a report. Displays, I'm sorry, Joe. But there's been, there's been reports that actually um, um, some ticks can carry um, um, Bartonella and although though and, and that that has been reported i had mentioned in the earlier that 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 crab lice uh, don't care but but there have been ticks that have been shown to carry bartonella as well so um but but that is not the mainstay of of um um transmission but as you know any of this uh, when you talk about frequent travel, you're going to put Lyme disease in, especially in the United States, you're going to put Lyme disease in your panel because, uh, you know, Lyme disease is a big masquerader and, and you can get uh, a, uh, uh, you know, optic nerve uh, swelling and, 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 a, and a neuritis, uh, uh, optic neuritis from, from, uh, uh, from Lyme's disease. So that again is, is, is travel and due to tick bites. Yeah. So it's kind of travel going kind of maybe with some more outdoor activities, not me yes, kind of hop into a different uh, conference and stay, sitting in in the lecture hall. Got it. Now. Right. That, this is that, not, that this is me. not, this is not airborne. <laughs> and, uh, and as we know, this one is not STD. All right. I got, I'm, I'm with you now. It's more or less getting out there in the animals, you know, Joe Gus goes to Australia and he's out there with the crocodiles and scorpions. So it's more the, the more the nature type of travel, frequent yes. travel. Got it. Yeah. You know, Barry, you it, see, it, it, ahead, it, 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 it isn't sexually transmitted unless, you know, the patient's weirder than you thought. <laughs> yeah. And Greg, you see Lyme disease up there in, in PA, you know, I, I yeah. travel up there quite frequently and, uh, um, you know, so, so, uh, you know, the tick infestation in 
the the United States is has gotten. I mean, it's it's significantly more than what it was when 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 you and I were growing up, as I can recall, because we spent a lot more time in the woods and never had ticks on them. Yep, it's uh, it's definitely rampant up in this area, as you know. So, well, Barry, uh, I'll let uh, Joe check out the uh, the questions, make some comments here before we wrap this up. But I just want to say thank you. Uh, your favorite cases have now become my favorite cases. That was very enjoyable. And thanks for doing this for us tonight. Yeah, it's, it's a my great pleasure. And thorough, thorough explanation of, of each of those. I think uh, a lot of clinical pearls uh, have come forth. We really appreciate your, your, your expertise, your clinical knowledge here, Barry. And I think uh, that was a really good presentation. And I appreciate you guys. Um, you know, we, the three of us have shared the stage uh, um, before, and it's always a pleasure uh, just sitting, uh, sitting back and, uh, and, and discussing cases with you. And I always uh, appreciate and, and respect your inputs. And there are no, uh, no questions, but you're getting a virtual round of applause right now in the chat room, Barry. Everybody's saying thank you. We appreciate it. Great lecture. Great information. So, uh, you can you you know take take your bow. You're getting your virtual round of applause. Well, I'm getting a you. question. I appreciate here. everybody. There's a question yeah, I, here. It came to me yeah. directly, Joe. It's, uh, it says, okay. "Let me read it." it says any. Oh, it keeps changing as people are adding stuff. Any oral use of L-lysine in any of the natural antiviral proven helpful to slow or halt viral or no uh, or no or no effective, uh, no effect. You know, that's, that, 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 that's, that's a, um, that's a good question. I don't have any experience. They said L-lysine. Yeah. L-lysine is an amino acid. It's been, yeah, that's yeah. going all the way back to the uh, herpes part where there's some right. loose association. L-lysine is needed to support the immune system. Um, you know, for the natural paths that are out there, you know, you can use it about a thousand milligrams a day. Uh, and that has been shown in some people uh, to maybe to decrease the reoccurrence of the herpes. So, um, you know, the studies are kind of mixed, but, you know, if, you know, if you're into the natural side of it, certainly is a good recommendation. And just comments, Barry, very interesting cases and presentations. Uh, so this is best virtual meeting I have been a part of. So with that being said, uh, we're right on time there, that hour and 40 minutes will conclude the, uh, the CE.